settled this mountain. And in Mark 11, 23, it says this, Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, I thank you for entrusting me to carry these morsels from your word to the family in this place today. And I pray that you will direct the words and the sentiment of the, of the scripture, Lord, it right to where you want it to go and it will cause the effect that you want it to have in Jesus' name. Amen. So this mountain refers to something uh, that you are facing in life that seems impossible. It seems as if, as if no effort on your part or in the natural can conquer or bring an end to the situation. Speaking to the mountain. Jesus said, when you say to this mountain, when you speak to something or someone, you address it directly. You don't turn your back on it. You don't beat around the bush. It's not a secret wish. And Jesus said, if anyone says to this mountain, ordering the mountain, Jesus here is recommending confrontation with the mountain. Giving orders is about authority. This is not about our own authority. This is about God's authority vested in the believer. As a minister, I have authority to marry people and to pronounce them husband and wife. But the authority comes from the state by the authority vested in me, by the state of Pennsylvania, and I usually add, and, and as one who carries the gospel, I pronounce you husband and wife. The confrontation that Jesus is recommending addresses God's authority over the mountain. And then he said something about not doubting in this verse. Jesus here is saying that we should not doubt God's ability to move the mountain. I can't move it. You can't move it. If we can't move it, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God does the impossible. We don't do that. We don't have the power. God does it. He uses his power to bless us and get rid of our mountain. So then he says, believe what they say will happen. It will be done for them. That is, it will be done by God. Our part is to believe and not doubt. What you see is not a fantasy. What you see is reality. Unless you're a little bit out of your mind, then you might see fantasies. But what you see is reality. I'm real. Pinch me if you don't think I am. It's not a fantasy. The mountain, then, is real. What you believe about God's ability is supernatural. The mountain is real. But what you believe about God's ability is supernatural. Believe that God is able yeah. to do anything and everything. He is sovereign. All things in heaven and earth are subject to him. Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to immediately, to do imme immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us. There are all kinds of mountains. Sin is the most difficult mountain to overcome. Sin is the most harmful mountain that we face. It's the deadliest of all mountains. It takes the direct act of God in the form of conviction of the Holy Spirit to bring a, center, a sinner to repentance. 
Salvation is so powerful of a miracle that all heaven rejoices. We don't see all heaven rejoicing when God divided the Red Sea. It doesn't say that. We don't see heaven rejoicing when God heals someone of cancer or of blindness. But heaven rejoices, we're told, when a sinner repents. Luke 15, 17, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Another one is addictions. I don't understand addictions. Even those who are addicted don't understand it. I thank God that I've never been addicted to substances. Well, I was addicted to chewing gum once. That's true. I had to get my morning gob of chewing gum at the store before I go out and do my work because I didn't want to run out of chew. I was a chain chewer, one after another. <laughs> I started off with Wrigley Spearmint, and then I ended up on the hard stuff, Big Red. <laughs> and I couldn't get enough of it. And then one morning, I couldn't wait. It was Sunday morning in church. I couldn't wait to finish with communion so I could get a stick of gum in my mouth. And God spoke to my heart. And I never have had another ch ch stick of chewing gum, ever. And that's a silly thing to think of. But I was addicted to chewing gum. I might have to, cold, to go cold turkey on ice cream. That's how I got old. That's how I got this way. So we see addictions everywhere. Drugs, alcohol, tobacco, they're all harmful. You can be addicted to unseen things, mental and spiritual and emotional things that cause harm. You can be addicted to all kinds of things. Illness. Here in our church, a lot of people face mountains of illness you know we have 20 people regularly in attendance here and probably half of us including myself has some kind of physical problem or other you know probably half of us and i know uh, i told you before i pray for every one of you twice a day and i know every one of you where it hurts <laughs> i know what your aches and pains are i know what you i know Except for the young ones. I got a young family right there. They don't have any. And Richie, I don't he doesn't have any. But outside of that, I know where it hurts, so I know how to pray for most of you, which I do twice a day. Some of these seem like a mountain in our eyes. Fears. We'll have some kind of fear. And sometimes that's a, that's a mechanism that's designed to get us out of harm's way. But sometimes fear keeps us, it keeps us out of danger. Some fear is natural. When fear dominates a person's life, it becomes a phobia. Phobias are real. They can ruin someone's life. This is from a website called Very Well Mind. And it says, phobias are one of the most common mental illnesses in the United States. The National Institute of Mental Health suggests that 8% of U.S. adults have some type of phobia. Then it says, women are more likely to experience phobias than men. Typical symptoms of phobias can include nausea, trembling, rapid heartbeat, feelings of unreality, and being preoccupied with the fear object. Some of the phobias, here's some familiar ones. You guys know what this is, arachnophobia, fear of spiders, you know what that one is? I think we're all creeped out by spiders. Claustrophobia, fear of small places or spaces. Acrophobia is the fear of heights. Aerophobia is a fear of flying. We all, if we didn't have one of those, we usually know somebody that did. Here's some uh, strange ones, though. 
Trypophobia is a fear of holes. Electorophobia is a fear of chickens. Now, I'll try to pronounce this one. Hippopotamon strassus quipida leophobia is a fear of long words. <laughs> That's true. Globophobia is a fear of balloons. Podophobia is a fear of feet. I don't know if that's a, like fear of your own feet. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> Compounophobia is a fear of buttons. Pediophobia is a fear of dolls. Doesn't have to be Chucky, just a fear of dolls. Catoptrophobia is a fear of mirrors. Oomphalophobia is a fear of belly buttons. And those are real, those are true. Those are real. Faith, or the relief from fear, comes from God. Mark chapter 9, starting with verse 14, says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. And then Jesus said in verse 19, You unbelieving generation. Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When Jesus, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And then Jesus said, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure, impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind, this kind can come out only by prayer. I think the King James might say prayer and fasting. Mark chapter 9, which we were just in, and verse 23, which we read, Jesus said, if you can, that was a quote, if you can, everything's possible for one who believes. And then the boy's father said, I do believe. And it says that he exclaimed, I do believe. Help my unbelief. The boy's father believed in God's ability to give him faith. He believed that Jesus could give him the faith. It's God's faith, Hebrews 12, 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he entered the cross, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
from the notes in the Life in the Spirit Study Bible, in the Greek, in verse 22, where it says, have faith in God, correctly translated is faith of God. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. In the Greek, the word is pistin theu. It can be understood by the Greek objective genitive case, making it piston theu, literally faith of God. In the sense of faith given by God for the miraculous that requires the response of faith in God from us. God gives us the faith to believe in him to move the mountain. So God is to be the object of our faith. We get saved because we believe. Lord, I believe you're the son of God. Our faith is on and in him, not in our ability to believe him. He gives us that ability. Faith is not about us. It's not about what I think. It's not about, it's, it's not about what I say. It's not about what I don't say. It's about who I believe in. Abraham believed God. Not the promise, he believed God. His faith was in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. The it, it was credited to him, was Abraham's faith, which was focused on God. God gave him that faith. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Believe God with the faith that God gives us. Focus on not the problem, not the mountain, but the problem solver, the mountain mover. Amen. <laughs> Bet you haven't seen one of those before. <laughs> I'm not the mountain mover, God is. My words reflect my expectation, reflect the faith that God has given me to believe that he has the power to move my mountain. He has the power. I believe that he has the power. When and how he uses the power is a matter of his will, his sovereignty. I cannot force the hand of God with my words to do anything. I can ask. I should ask in faith. The rest is up to God. God's timing is perfect. His, his methods are perfect. I trust in his power. I trust in his sovereignty. Connie Krauss, who was with us, got cancer. She got surgery. I don't know how did she go three years before before God took her home? Three years. Up and down. Her numbers were good. She'd look good and then then her numbers would be bad again. And, and that was a three-year battle. And we believed. We prayed and believed that God would heal her. And he did when he took her home. Your illness doesn't follow you into heaven. It's God's business how he does it, when he does it. It's God's business. It's God's doing. So we accept that. She's healed. She's in heaven and she's healed. Amen? We miss her. Her husband misses her. Also from the notes in the Life and the Spirit Study Bible, referring to verse 24, it says, Believe he shall have them, referring to that faith that receives is not something humanly produced. Rather, it is a believing faith imparted to the believer's heart by God himself. Do you remember when you didn't believe? I can remember when I didn't believe. 
I can remember when I refused to believe. It wasn't in my power to just to turn on faith and it was the Holy Spirit, an act of the Holy Spirit to break down the wall, actually in the veil, in the, in the Word. And I came to believe. Sometimes the fulfillment that true faith desires is granted immediately. At other times it is not. Yet God gives the faith that the prayer has been heard and the request will be granted. Amen. The uncertainty concerns the time of fulfillment, not the regranting of the request. <laughs> There's three keys. The source of faith, it has, he said, have faith in God. Some people today say have faith in your feelings or have faith in yourself. The Bible says he that trusteth in himself is a fool. New Agers and some others cry have faith in your faith. Jesus said have faith in God. Your faith cannot be any stronger than the object or the source in which it is placed. Have faith in God. In Hebrews 11.5 it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You're not going to diligently seek anything that you don't believe in. I doubt, anyway. Mark 11, 20 and 24 is a favorite passage um, of theirs, of some, some, which they take out of context to support their heresy. Jesus made this promise on the recognized premise that prayer must be in harmony with God's will. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And this, if we know that he heareth us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Jesus prayed in submission to the Father's will. Secondly, the simplicity of the faith, whosoever, Mark 10, 14, but when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said to them, Suffer the little children to come to me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say to you, whoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. I must tell you that a, a month ago, Wednesday morning, a month ago, I was having a service down at my home church, a senior adult service. One of the seniors brought a grandson. I think he's six years old, maybe. And she said, he's always talking about God. And we gathered around the front and had a prayer time down there, praying for people's needs. And I said to that little boy, Hunter's his name, I said, do you pray for people? And he said, yeah, I do. So I knelt down on the floor in front of him. I put the oil on his finger. And I said, put that on my forehead and pray for me. Because I have... Um, they call it um, bone spurs in my heels and in my ankle and I had pain from that I have, all, I have inserts to put in my shoes and stuff like that so he prayed for me and I have not had one pain in my feet in a month and I had them every day because this little boy has faith <laughs> have a little kid pray for you seriously Whosoever shall say to this mountain. It was Peter's comments about the withered fig tree that preceded Jesus' discourse on faith. Now Jesus did not teach on faith with the, intern, with the intent that his disciples might travel the countryside cursing fig trees. Nor did he desire that as their faith grew, they would cast the Mount of Olives into the Dead Sea. It was not necessary to fulfillment of God's will. Our prayer should be that if God's will can be served through removal of obstacles, that he, then he would remove it. 
prayer should be that if God's will is served by removing those things, our mountain, then he would remove it. Jesus never moved a mountain, a physical mountain. He stood on plenty of them. The Sermon on the Mount, the Mount of Olives, he preached from them, but he never tried to move one. That is not literal mountains. When he comes back, he's going to split one in half. This is where the hard stuff comes. You have to wait on God. You have to walk with God. You have to wait on God. And you have to seek God. That's what, that's what the hard parts are. So do you have a mountain today? What's your mountain today? Is it God's will to remove that mountain? Do you believe? And are you willing to wait? Because that's the part where you honor God's sovereignty. Ask God to increase your faith, but then you must wait. Because God's in charge, and it's His, it's His to do when He wants to do it, and how He wants to do it. Sometimes He surprises you. Bring something your way, not what you ask for, not what you were trying to tell God to do, but a totally different way. It's amazing. When I, I used to be a photographer. 45 years I made my living with a camera. And after the first five years in which we got saved, I was seeking the Lord to be, because she started having babies, and so we needed more income, but I really liked the job I had. So I was trying to tell the Lord how to bless us. Trying to tell God how to do that. It doesn't work that way. And so I got a letter from a photography place in, in Peoria, Illinois, which is the last place I ever wanted to go to, saying, Woody, we need you here now. And a friend of mine who I'd worked with went out there I didn't, want to, I didn't want to go, but that was what God's will was. So we went out there and worked out there for five years and learned how to do the business that I conducted here for 35 years. I learned how to do that. It's hard to learn. Well, it was then hard to learn how to just let God do it. Just let God do it. His time and His way. That's, that's the hard part. Would you stand? I'm just about done talking now. That's an unconventional way for ministers to close a sermon. I'm done talking now. <laughs> if any one of you is facing a mountain and you need prayer, 